One of the most influential tech channels in the online space is none other than MKBHD. Marquez Brownlee shaped his own path in the tech space and with an incredible team behind him, it's no surprise how his videos are able to be consistently amazingly well produced. But today, this isn't about him. In fact, it's about the person who Marquez trusts to edit his videos and could teach us all about the importance of being a team player. And that person is Mariah Zink. You need to let things go if they just don't make sense. You can't just keep things just because you made them. Do you feel like any experiences are different for you in the editing space? Just because I always felt like I normally only see men in a lot of these spaces. If you couldn't hand a hard drive or an SSD to another person and they can't open it and immediately find everything, dumpster fire. If you don't work well with others in a collaborative environment, you're just not gonna do very well. First of all, I wanna say thank you for coming on today. And given that you work with Marquez, I don't know exactly if um, a lot of people know that you're even an editor for the channel. So if you can, I would like you to first start off uh, introducing yourself. Like what is it that you do? And obviously you work with Marquez. So what exactly do you do for him as well? Yeah, sure. Um, happy to be here. Uh, I'm Mariah and I'm an editor for the MKBHD channel. And I do a little bit of everything. I edit for our main channel, um, occasionally edit for our some of our subsidiary channels. We have um, a studio channel, which features um, my coworkers and just stuff in the office. So sometimes I'll pop in and help with that. Every once in a while, I'll pop in on the podcast and help out when they need a hand. So I'm kind of around for everything. But yeah, primarily I'm editing for our main channel, which I think is close to 19 million subs right now or is like just past 18 million. So we're cruising this year. We're, we're doing pretty well. Wait, have you been there for like a year and a half now, two years, something like that? Yeah, this spring it's going to be two years, which is crazy. <laughs> so. Well, what was the onboard process for that? Just because, again, I know he was someone that mainly would edit his own stuff. So when I heard about you, I was like, wow, he actually did it. <laughs> he got a, another editor. We're all still surprised. Genuinely still surprised. It's pretty informal for the most part. I feel like most YouTube channels operate pretty informally overall. It's a pretty easy like style, I feel like, to get started in because he has a very like defined editing style. Um, so there wasn't a lot of hand holding from the beginning. It's just kind of like, you know, I'll I'll give you one or two and you can start and then we'll kind of we'll see how those go and we'll do, you know, rounds of feedback and notes and then slowly over time we're trying to get more to like 50-50. So like I'll edit like 50% of the videos and then he'll edit the other half of the videos. It's been a slow process, but I think we're we're in a good place now, especially having to transfer over from Adobe to Final Cut has been a big change. So now before Marquez, then how did you get started? And then since we're mentioning software, have you been an Adobe user before? Or were you also just Final Cut or so I've been editing probably for gosh, since like 2008, in some form, that doesn't mean it was all good. But like I've been editing for a pretty long time. And um, I've worked my way through uh, making some hot garbage but yeah so I've been going for a good while uh, I went to college for video production specifically um, and so that was definitely a very safe place to learn like what is good and what is absolutely terrible um, and get some really good feedback but yeah I've had kind of a strange trajectory overall um, directly going from graduating college and then getting like a job right before COVID and then working there for just a couple of years until I came here. So kind of just like, this is my literally my second job out of college, which is crazy. So then going to Premiere to Final Cut, you know, having to use that, does Mark Hez at all entertain the idea of ever switching around or are you guys just kind of stuck using what he likes? I think he will always use what he wants, but I don't think he's opposed to us using something that would make our lives easier. Um, I think he tries to make Final Cut into Premiere, but... There's only so much you can do to uh, to make them similar, but it works for him, so that's what he likes. I was actually considering switching back to Adobe just recently um, solely for like their audio mixing and plugins and stuff. Because Final Cut literally has like zero support for most audio related things. You said that you went to school for this and then, but you've been doing it also as a hobby, I assume, like prior to that. Was there any way that kind of got you interested in starting editing like for me it was always watching animation movies and stuff because that's my biggest inspiration but like what got you into doing video editing i feel like the real answer is pretty sad and it's uh 
I, it's very like of the era. I don't know if you were a f- watcher of um, iCarly back in like 2006 oh, yes. or 2008, but like every person was like, man, this is so cool. Like, I want to be doing this. I want to be shooting video with my friends and like, it, which was basically YouTube. Like, if you think about it, they were basically like live streaming on like a YouTube platform or like something of the era. So my cousin and I were really into that. Um, and so I got like a camera for my birthday when I was a kid and then just kind of took off from there. We just make our hot little garbage and just upload it to YouTube so we could like share it back and forth between us and our family. And then and I'm still on YouTube like 10 years later, just in a different way. Can we know a little bit more about your every or your day to day life now that you've joined the MKBHD team? Like, can you take us and explain a little bit of like what a day normally would look like for you? Spoiler, it's not going to be as exciting as everyone thinks it is. Um, I feel like People have this vision, this grandiose vision of what they think being a YouTuber or like working for a YouTuber might be. And it's a lot more nitty gritty than you would think it is. Usually I'll come in um, and then I'll check our notion to see what I've been assigned to edit for the week. And some weeks it's a little bit lighter, um, some weeks it's a little bit heavier. I'll usually coordinate with Marquez and see kind of like what's in our pipeline for that week or like what's coming up, if we have any like embargoes that are happening. Um, and then try and collect all of our assets from the rest of our team. So usually I'm probably the last person to know that something's happening until it's either already happened or is like about to happen. Um, So then I'm kind of trying to fill in the gaps of like, okay, well, what is this? What's going on? What else do we need? Um, Which happens very quickly depending on how quickly we we need to get it out. So it could be a day or two of turning around something it could be a month if it's like a weird unscripted shoot but a lot of our scripted stuff usually is out the door pretty fast given that you also said that you do kind of a little bit of everything outside of editing as well what what is there what are some of the little things that you do outside of editing too i don't i feel like i insert myself i'm like i hear you need help and then i'm like trying to come in and do stuff um just just anything to get away from my desk it's nice to not be locked to your desk for like hours Um, I mean, the other week we had a problem with um, actually some of our podcast cameras in this room were having some software issues, um, and it was right before we were about to shoot. So it was uh, a bunch of us trying to troubleshoot and, like, uh, update firmware and reset some stuff on the cameras and check the power supplies. So I'll check, help with just equipment things. If somebody needs a hand with, like, a shoot, I'll pop in and, like, operate some of our cameras. I popped in. There's a clip of me somewhere floating around on the podcast when um, our producers were out during the holidays and I just stepped in and helped a little bit. So, yeah, I think it's it's beneficial to know a little bit of everything because then you can kind of be that helping hand when people just, you know, are lost and just need help with something real quick. Um, So good to step in. Good to help. For me, when it comes to working with Tom, that's essentially my job as well is not only do I do the editing and then the motion graphics work, but Uh, It is part of what I consider to be my job to be like his second in command as well, at least in terms of like, okay, Tom's recording or he's about to record, but he's going to be a couple minutes late. I know how to work the studio lights. Let me get that started. Um, If he wants me to turn on the Mac and get stuff ready for recording, I could. Like the goal is just to be there for every step of the way. So it sounds like you and I am to assume a lot of the the other members are kind of like that as well. Just whatever needs to get done, we can just kind of get it done. And I think it's good to have that attitude rather than just being like, I'm just going to do my thing and I'm not going to help you. Like it gets stuff done so much faster. Like if I was just trying to troubleshoot these cameras, it would have taken me like an hour. But because there's literally like four of us all trying to do it at the same time, we figured it out like so much quicker. Um So definitely you can just get through production much faster if everybody's willing to help. I really loved it when I first saw that um, you guys were making the studio channel. So you guys, you know, I always see it as like a behind the scenes channel while also sharing, I would assume, like just more information that the main channel wouldn't normally give. So do you feel like the studio channel is also part of like what you guys do behind the scenes, but also it's kind of like work in a sense where you're also making sure that channel continuously uploads? Yeah, it's kind of, it's going through a bit of a metamorphosis right now, um, kind of finding its foothold. It is a nice place where it's mostly almost a special interest, like topic dumping zone where like different people in the office will have an idea for something and they just really just want to share their passion about something. Um, 
and those might not have a place on the main channel or maybe there's something that was not good enough to you know fly on the main channel and we just wanted to discuss it a little more in detail and a little more casual um but it's nice and also the way that like it is a, still a little bit behind the scenes like you might be learning about a camera from David but you'll also see David in many different environments and like different circumstances and stuff so um it's kind of putting like faces and names to the jobs that you wouldn't otherwise see with there being so many of you guys in terms of members because usually when I meet a lot of creators um I'll know like one creator who has like two people working for him or for them and what have you but like I feel like you guys have like how many is it like five or seven or something of you uh you know what let me check my slack I think that there might be 14 right now it's at 13 um yeah lucky lucky 13 holy so uh it's a little bigger we have uh one or two remote people and um some people that pop in a couple times a week and then people that are here every day so it's a little bit different for everybody well with there being so many members and are are you guys all in in one location and just sharing like the studio space or you i know some of you will be remote but you know how is it normally yeah majority everybody's in which i feel like is not typical like a very nine to five type job where it's we have an office we are coming in the same time every day we're leaving at the same time most days very unusually normal schedule which i feel like is mostly not the case for most uh at least influencers or i assume isn't probably the case now out of curiosity when it comes to the mkbhd team uh, I believe, and I might be wrong, but I believe you're the only woman there. Is, am, am I right? Or that is very true. I am the only uh, the only girl over here right now. And I, I'm just curious, like, how do you how does it feel being like, let's say, the only woman on the team? But then also, like, do you feel like any experiences are different for you in the editing space? Just because I always felt like I normally only see men in a lot of these spaces, you know? It's funny you say that because I actually was having this conversation with somebody else like a week ago. I was visiting um, a museum and they had an old, um, like the tape, like film editing where you're like slicing the film and like cutting it and stuff. And in the picture, it was like all women. And my friend was like, oh, that's crazy. And I was like, yeah, did you notice that it's all ladies over here? Um, Because editing used to be a woman's space. Like it was predominantly a woman's sphere. Like... Um, so it's weird that it's had this like shift of like, I think men are just like, this is pretty cool. I'm good at this. And then like, I don't know, it's changed over time. Um, so it's weird having kind of the reverse of like less women around and stuff, um, when it's been historically a women's space, but I don't think I've had any like crazy bad experiences or anything. Um, if anything, I mean, our job, my job now is like, everyone's very like receptive and like isn't gonna like put down any ideas and is very just kind of like no one's like I know better than you woman like you know editing and stuff um so I don't know it is interesting though because you'll notice when you're the only one in a space and I'm sure that applies to many things and many different circumstances being the only one in a space you just you see things a little bit differently so I almost kind of feel like it's an advantage in a way because I'm seeing things that other people aren't quite seeing or aren't picking up on um and so I feel like then I'm able to bring different ideas forward it's just different people different ideas you know question for you when it comes to your editing software of choice as well as Marquez's so you have mentioned that you used Adobe and then he's been Final Cut for a long time now has that ever been uh like I don't want to say a problem but the fact that like you said that he doesn't mind you guys using software uh, that makes your guys' life easier. But given that you were predominantly in the Adobe suite before and now you're using Final Cut for him, how's that difference been for you? Like, what are some advantages of being in Final Cut as opposed to, you know, using Adobe? Yeah, I feel like the core of the workflow is basically the same, except for just like one makes your life infinitely easier and the other one just has like so many roadblocks for no reason. I I'm not a fan of the Adobe Monopoly, but unfortunately they just have like really good programs and keep buying like small subsidiaries to make their programs better because they have more money. Um, Not a fan of the subscription platform, but it's a darn good program for what it is. Yeah, I feel like the only times I have issues um, 
with using like a different program, uh, just working with like a team in a team scenario is like exchanging files or like projects or if um, we're needing to uh, export audio for editing and mixing and stuff like that. There's roadblocks with working with a team when you're using Final Cut versus Adobe. Adobe has a lot of like dynamic linking things. Yeah, I don't know. It just has a lot of little hurdles that kind of add up over time. Okay. If you guys are using Final Cut then for your edits and then I assume your, I don't know if you guys have like a graphics guy or a motion graphics guy, but when he gives you guys files, what's the workflow for that? Do you just request it and then you just kind of get an export or? Yeah, Michael is this magical little fairy of a gentleman who I send him a request and then it appears in my Slack hours later. And I don't know how he does it, but he just cranks them out. Um, but usually I'm just getting an exported file. And the problem with that is that then we've had issues of like, I need to change something, you know, and I don't want to wait three hours to get it back if your internet's bad. Um, and so having the ability to access like original assets is really important. So he could give me all the After Effects files and I could have all that accessible, um, expedites your workflow if it was also dynamically linked then I'm saving even more time um, but with Final Cut I'm kind of just getting the final the last step of the process and then hoping it's working and that if I need to change something it's gonna it's gonna take forever basically. Can you take us into what a typical workflow day looks like for you? So for example just to share my workflow with Thomas Frank he'll get he'll be on the set he records the cameras he'll record a separate audio file he'll put everything into our server, because uh, luckily we use that. Um, although our server's been giving me issues lately and I'm getting really fed up with it, but nonetheless. So we put everything in the server and then normally when I'm editing, uh, because I also use Adobe products. So uh, I open up Premiere, I do the A-roll, uh, we sync up the audio with that. And then when it comes to actually cutting and such, um, I always start with A-roll first. After that, I'll, I'll do some sound, some B-roll, uh, motion graphics comes next. And then the last part of it too would be if Tom ever, for whatever reason, wants to open that project to get into it, which doesn't happen often, I just save the file or we'll make a duplicate of that file so he accesses it. Uh, so that way, if he makes any changes, we can just quickly compare it and see which one we want to use. Now, since Marquez also, I know, edits, and then you guys also need to like request stuff from, let's say, other team members. Yeah, what does a normal workflow then kind of sound like for you guys? I'll try and walk you through it best I can. Um, I'll take the OnePlus video that just came out, for example. Um, we just I just did the OnePlus 12 video this past week. And so with something like that, I am assigned a Notion. And depends, but sometimes I'll come in and there will be cards on my desk ready for me to um, ingest into my computer. Um, everything I'm doing is local storage on an eight terabyte SSD on the, um, what is this? The MacBook, like the M1 Max or whatever. So this thing rips, this thing's fast. Like I don't even use M3. I don't use M2. Like it's pretty fast on its own at rendering files, um, and tri like importing files as well. So, um, usually I'll have normally the A roll, sometimes we'll shoot B roll first and then I'll just have time to go through that initially and like organize it. But I'll get a roll and audio from our mixer and then I'll be syncing um, and final cut. And usually I'll blast through all of that and cut a lot of the dead air out since it's fully scripted. Most things on the main channel, completely scripted. Um, some things are a little looser and I feel like it's easier to tell that they're like unscripted, but most things, that's why it's so fast or because everything's scripted. Um, so generally I'm having the script on one side of my screen and then I'm following along as I'm going through. And sometimes there'll be notes of like, we need to include this little piece or like, do we like this? And sometimes we'll have to like go do a pickup. Like for this last video, there was two separate pickups where, um, something about the camera information in the phone was not correct. And so then we had to take that out and then he had to go record new audio for me on two separate occasions um, and then trying to get that to mix with everything else in the regular VO. So including any pickups, um, I'll be dropping in B-roll as I go. But it's interesting because at the same time, I'm also learning about the product as I'm also editing. So it's kind of like I'm experiencing it almost at the same time you're experiencing it. Um, 
so that's why it's nice to have my coworker David next to me um, who does a lot of the writing and researching. So if I have a question, I literally just turn like to my right and I'm like, or my left and I'm like, David, what is this? Explain this to me um, for any weird high level technical things. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the only time stuff is weird is when maybe I'll need to request like, I need to fill this gap. Can you get me B-roll? Or like um, if they're going on location somewhere, that's those are the times that usually the editing flow is totally disrupted. We shot a car video over in Ohio um, for the Rimic Nevera, one of like the fastest like electric cars ever made. Um, and so that workflow completely unscripted for the most part, um, except for just getting like stats and stuff. Um, a lot of just driving on random city streets. And so that is completely different from a scripted workflow, um, which would be even more intricate. And then, but by the time that I'm done, I'll do an export through Frame.io, which is now an Adobe product. I think they bought them, um, if you're not familiar oh, yeah. with it. Yeah. So usually I'll do an export. Marquez will give me some notes. Um, we'll go back and do another export after that. And once it's like picture locked, and we know everything's in that we need, all the pickups there, everything's good to go, the music, I'll send it to our sound guy. And so he will mix it while I'm polishing the color on the B-roll and like dropping any last minute graphics from Michael or if like we're waiting on something weird to come in. Um, so it happens pretty quickly for the scripted stuff. It's it's really, really fast now. Well, with that though, how is it... How's it with a uh, work-life balance then? You know, given that you guys are treating this as, let's say, like a nine to five, is that like the hard cutoff point? And do you make sure you leave at five or, you know, how does it normally work for you? I, I think everyone has their own thing, but I am very rigid about respecting my nine to five boundaries. I don't like to always have to bring things home, but like, I'll obviously I will do it if it's needed, but it's not like an everyday activity. I'm not editing till midnight trying to get things out because you know boss man needs it like right now um sometimes we'll have people stay like due to like scheduling like you know sometimes our podcast needs to be out by a certain time and you know they might have filmed it only a day or two prior so like they might be kind of down to the wire getting stuff done um usually if we have embargoes that is the that's crunch time things like the apple vision pro like you know that needs to be out on time that needs to be ready to go and there's no time to waste. So things like that, the schedule is a little more flexible, but it is very nice having, you know, knowing that, that it is nine to five, I'm going home, I get to go see my dog, I get to go, you know, hang out and do stuff. And I'm not like a slave to my editing desk, which is really great. No, I think that's good. Cause a lot of us, I would say normally, depending if you're a creator or someone like me who does treat this as a job, but then also has all these passion projects, I think it's good to know when to cut it off because I personally am still trying very hard to find that balance. And, you know, given that like I could get sick and that's like the only real time I have where I can mentally say I don't need to work right now because I also just physically can't. Uh, so hearing that you like to really separate that, it is refreshing to hear that because I definitely need to hear that as well. Um, but for you then, are you mainly then editing just at, at work then? Like, do you have any passion side projects that you work on or anything like that? When the inspiration strikes me, I'll usually make something for myself. I don't feel like I need to always pump out things into the universe. I just feel like compelled to make something. Usually it's like I'm either annoyed by something or I've just learned something crazy that I'm obsessed with or, you know, some weird combination of the two and I feel like when it's like an inspiration project like that I can get it done really fast but then I just want to I want to keep it to myself I don't need to put everything out in the void or I just want to send something to my cousin or I just want to send something to a friend of mine that like I know like they're going to be interested in this um, kind of thing so I feel like there's a lot of creative work in my work here which is nice because it's very like they're open to like ideas from anybody or if like I want to express myself on the studio channel that's like a safe place to put something out there um but yeah I don't do I don't really do freelance on the side right now I don't really do any crazy side projects I'm not opposed but I just it's nice to kind of like 
go edit and then you know you're done editing and then I can just go do Baldur's Gate or I can go do something else. Um, so seasonally, I'll, I'll do something for myself, but it's not a, a monthly thing always. Well, you mentioned Baldur's Gate. So does that mean you're also kind of a gamer then or do you have favorite games or anything? Uh, I feel like gamer is so... It's a trap. We can't say I can't say I'm a gamer, um, but uh, I do have a PS5 and uh, I am playing Baldur's Gate. I'm I was really into the God of War franchise. That was great. Love that. So excited for the DLC. I've been waiting to like do the DLC they announced. But yeah, maybe maybe there'll be a time to do something gaming related on the studio channel potentially. And given that the studio then can be a place where you guys can have ideas and kind of share something to the audience there. Uh, and treat it like a safe space, like you said. Have you contributed to a studio video yet? Like, have you came up with an idea and you guys actually made it into a video? From scratch, it's funny you say that because I'm actually working on something right now that I kind of started back, actually in October. I was inspired in October by something. And um, we got to go visit um, CES this past January, which is like this insane consumer electronics show with like all this weird industry things and tech that you'll never see anywhere else. And I'm working on a project right now that hopefully will be out this spring, just pending some things. Um, just a quick little video about uh, food automation and the food, uh, the future of food technology. Um, so kind of looking as that at that as a whole and just kind of seeing like where we stand with it. Um, I there was this crazy TikTok I got about this completely automated. Uh, like home cooking appliance where like you put in the food and then it like launches it into like a cooking like a skillet and like cooks it and has like pr programmed recipes all these weird things so stuff like that like I love weird hyper specific things that then can be talked about in like the larger scope or like a larger scale um, so you'll definitely see something soon it'll be a little bit but you'll see something so for your personal needs then uh, what what is it that you use every day for your in your everyday tech life Oh God, I think there's a video somewhere on the studio channel of this, but it we did like an EDC video. I like to use things as long as I can until they break or like I have to upgrade. Um, mostly motivated by not spending money. Um, I think I'm literally using right now a um, a phone from our our like closet that we had. This is like a Pixel 6a or Pixel no Pixel Pixel 6. Um, I don't I think they're on like the eight or the nine by now. Um, Tech world moves too fast for me and I don't need, I don't feel like I need to keep up with the Joneses. Like I don't need like the newest thing. Um, I'm just happy to have something that works. So that's kind of my philosophy is just like, just keep it until you, <laughs> it's broken, so. No, that's fair, yeah. So, okay, so your phone, what, uh, it's a Pixel 6a, I believe, something like that. Pixel 6, I have the AirPods second, I'm gonna beauty guru this real quick. Uh, AirPods, uh, second generation um, that I'm wearing right now, still work perfectly fine. Other than the laptop, which I, you know, just it doesn't even need an upgrade. It works pretty well. The uh, M1 Max. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't use a ton of stuff in my daily life. I use the PS5 is probably like the newest thing that I own, honestly. When it comes to everything that you've been a part of and all of your experiences and all the knowledge you have from when you started till today. When it comes to anyone that's new in the editing space and they kind of want to start, you know, getting their career going, what do you think is some of the best advice you feel you can share for any new and up and coming editors? Don't be afraid to make something really bad because you're going to make something absolutely terrible before you make something that's like decently good. Collaborating is important. And if you can't take if you're not receptive to feedback, I, you're not going to you're not going to last. And I you know, that's, I don't make the rules. That's just kind of how it is. If you don't work well with others in a collaborative environment, you're just not going to do very well. Um, and editing is collaborative, whether you think it or not, there's a lot of moving factors in it. Um, at least for me, there's a lot of people that I'm working with and different teams and stuff. So working uh, together is really important. Um, being organized. If you're, this is my type A personality, but if your project and your file structure is unreadable and confusing and messy and if you couldn't hand a hard drive or an ssd to another person and they can't open it and immediately find everything dumpster fire you like you have to be organized people need to know where things are you need to know where things are you got to be organized you got to be on top of it um and don't edit after midnight 
that is my other thing. <laughs> do do not late night edit. That's every bad mistake I've made. It's late at night and I should have respected my work boundaries and I should have gone to sleep instead, but then instead I wanted to keep trying, but you're not making anything good when you're tired. Please sleep and like drink water. That is my recommendation. I 100% agree with you on the whole collaboration thing. Because whether it's in the YouTube space or in the professional space, like traditional media and such, right? When it comes to the YouTube space, I have seen more people who want to be a little more individualistic with what they decide to do in terms of their projects. And to, to be fair, to some degree, you can be that way in the YouTube space. But I also know some people who are interested in going in, let's say, TV or movies and such. And I can share this bit of wisdom for anyone that's watching this, which is the fact that I remember being told by one of my friends who works at Disney that a lot of times they go through a lot of new and up and coming editors. And the reason they go through them isn't because they lack any skill or anything like that. The reason that they end up being unqualified is because they were never really good at uh, receiving feedback. Meaning if you're not okay with doing a project for one month and in that month, the main editor will come in, see the work you've done and said, and they tell you that the director needs to change the focus. So that whole month work of work that you did means nothing now. If you can't take that in and say, okay, I understand that's better for the movie as opposed to, I feel like I just wasted a month of my life. You're not going to last long. And that's because for them, it's such a constantly changing environment that if you're opposed to that, a lot of people leave, you know, and, and I do think that there's some understanding of like why people don't want to feel like they're working. And then eventually when it gets tossed, they kind of feel like, well, what was the point of that? Like for me, I actually sometimes find that kind of exciting because to me, I see it as, oh, so we just found an even better way to tell the story. I'm a little pissed. But at the same time, I'm excited to see what we're going to do. Yeah, exactly. You have to be okay with letting go of things. Like you can't get too attached to something. I know there's people who are a little too close to their work and they take all the time to set up this really amazing, cool shot. And then they realize like this doesn't make sense to have or like this something about this wasn't right. But they don't want to get rid of it because they spent all the time and like, you know, they feel like something needs to come from it. But um it doesn't always need to be like that. Like we just sh tried to shoot um, a short for the studio channel with the Apple Vision Pro and we were still trying to understand how the product worked. And so uh, we didn't fully understand like some of the calibration stuff and we wanted to get a shot of everybody's eyes. So we were trying to bring in every single person in the office, spend everybody's time coming in, getting their eyes, getting a clip of them in this like space and just like doing a montage and then we shot it all we spent the whole day trying to figure out the lighting and like all the reflections and the glass were awful and it was like a whole thing and then I get down with the footage and I'm looking at it and you know hindsight's 2020 but I'm like I don't know if this is true to the product because we hadn't done the calibration correctly and so everybody obviously looked very goofy with their eyeballs and like things just didn't like look right and we ultimately decided that I think this would not be true like journalism to put out something that is misrepresenting a product just because it's fun or whatever. So I think you sometimes you got to take a step back and be like, does this make sense to do or like get a second opinion? Because you need to let things go if they just don't make sense. You can't just keep things just because you made them. And I think that's hard for people to learn especially when they're getting started because you put so much time into everything, but you have to be okay with saying this, ha this gotta go. They gotta put it in the trash, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Cause he, even with Tom, I still go through that. Like, well, you know, we can fuss over a, a motion graphic or whatever. And given that we originally wanted our deadline to be Friday and I'm rushing to get it done and get it to a somewhat pleasable state on Friday only to say, you know what, let's just push it till Monday or Tuesday, so you have an extra day. And I'm like, well, why was I rushing this whole time then? But a part of me is also like, this just means the project will be better. So I will accept that, you know? Um, and I think it's kind of hard to teach something like that. But I just think if anything, discussing it more and letting people know like, you have a right and I understand why you're angry, but try to see the bigger picture of it. Yeah, it's about the project. It's not about your feelings always. Like, it's like, what is the best? It's almost like it's a child. Like, do what is best for the child, but it's the project and just keep that in mind. All right. Well, 
when it comes to all of this, Mariah, you know, I, I really want to thank you for being on board. And uh, I'm really glad that we got to meet as well. For anyone that's watching, I do want to open up like the red carpet for you here. Uh, I don't know if you have like public, a lot of public social media, but if people wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to find you? Yeah, um, probably Instagram if you want to find me there um, or in the studio channel, like I'm around on the studio channel sometimes. Um, my Instagram handle, you can just drop it wherever you want. It's called totally not a business account. Um, and I definitely don't use it for business at all and don't have a regular personal account. Um, so don't find that either. I'm kind of, I'm online, chronically online, so you'll be able to find me probably in most places. And just curious, what, how did you figure out that name, Totally Not a Business Account? Uh, because I wanted to differentiate it from like a friends and family account, because I was like, because we're about to open the floodgates for uh, that like studio video of like introducing everybody, and I did not want people to find like my normie content. I'm like, we just got to... I don't know. I feel like people take themselves too seriously on social media. And I'm like, what if we just make it clear that like I'm here for business? But no, I get it. Because I also have a personal Instagram where I will only add people I genuinely know and want them to know even like little things, including my family. But if I'm like, if you have no business knowing that, just follow the Tony Santos one. You'll, you'll be fine there. Yeah, we're here for memes and MKBHD, and that's why you should follow my Instagram. <laughs> no, but thank you again. And if there's any information, maybe we can make like a follow-up uh, interview in the future where maybe we can touch on other topics. And if any of you watching this, if you have any things you guys would like me to ask Mariah next time, uh, leave them down in the comment section. And if this video does well, we'll definitely follow up with that. But like I said, nonetheless, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, it's been great chatting. Yeah, glad we could do this.